Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 15th NIAS MN Srinivas Memorial Lecture. I thank you all for coming, and I now request our director, Professor Baldev Raj, to welcome the participants and the audience. Good evening to all of you. Professor Srinivasan, we are grateful to you that you accepted our invitation to come and deliver Professor M. N. Srinivas Memorial Lecture. Professor Rodam Narsimha, Professor Ranganathan, my colleagues, the participants, and the friends who have come to listen to the lecture from Professor T. N. Srinivasan. Professor M. N. Srinivas has been the distinguished founder one of the founders of NIAS. Our traditions of dialogue with the open mind and not recognizing the disciplines and a capacity to find ways for the challenging issues facing society owes to a few individuals who came to NIAS, starting with J.R.D. Tata, Raja Ramana, and Amman Srinivas was one of the strong pillars. And what he addressed was one of the most intriguing problems which even today continues to be debated, the caste system. I don't think any of us, even with all our experiences, have a courage to create a dialogue which can stand the, which can stand the, I would not say it's acceptance, which can stand the capacity to create honest solution out of this system. And we know that we still continue to find a way. We need people like Amman Srinivas and many which in his lifetime created, which allows us to carry forward. Whenever I have looked at the work of Professor Amman Srinivas, and I have wondered that what kind of mind he has, one thing was very clear, like many leaders, which we are discussing in this program, he had an open mind, critical thinking, and a capacity to speak something which others would hesitate to do. So it would be very important for the participants who have come to listen to Professor T. N. Srinivasan, who is equally distinguished and who also has the foundation of his work to social sciences, to society, but with emphasis on economics. We we all look forward to listening to Professor T. N. Srinivasan. And he is also, for the participants especially, it is important that he is also going to be in NIAS campus, which he has readily agreed for a few days when you are here. So please feel very free to go to his room and talk to him and discuss because don't miss this opportunity of talking with him and dialoguing with him beyond the lecture. So I, my main job was to say that uh, we are fortunate and also to convince Professor Srinivasan that the spirit of dialogue, the, the tradition of dialogue and the intensity and the courage to take on the challenging problems of society is very much alive in NIAS. And that's why we particularly feel pride in having you and deliver Amman Srinivas Memorial Lecture. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's my honor and privilege to introduce both the speaker and the context in which he is giving this lecture, the Amman Srinivas Memorial Lecture. Uh, in the, given the few minutes that I have at my disposal, it's very easy for me to 
list out the many distinguished achievements of, of both Professor Srinivas, uh, M.N. Srinivas and Professor T.N. Srinivasan. Uh, but uh, I think if you look at the context in which this is happening and the importance of both these figures in Indian social science, it would be unfair to just restrict it to a few statements such as uh, the Padma Bhushan, the Professor M.N. Srinivas one, the fact that he was a member of the British Academy or a member of the Acad American Academy of Arts and Sciences. It's equally uh, simple to just spend time listing out the achievements of Professor T.N. Srinivasan. He was the Foreign Associate of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, I believe at the same time as Professor Rodam Narsimha was also here. Or to speak of, uh, he was a distinguished fellow of the American Economic Association. He's a recipient of the Padma Bhushan. He's a recipient of the Anne Kruger Award and so on. But it's important, I think, to recognize the context in which this work has occurred and why it's important for us today to look back at a time in Indian social science, which I think was clearly um, probably the, the, high, the most rewarding period of Indian social science. Uh, this, and this context was really understood, if you can just spend a minute understanding the way Indian social science has grown and then identify the contributions of both Professor M.N. Srinivas and Professor T.N. Srinivas into that process. Modern Indian social science comes in towards the 1920s and 30s when uh, Indian economics takes on a new modern role, quite apart from the earlier thinking of the drain theory, etc., which came with the national movement. It's identified typically with D.R. Gargil and V.K. Arvi Rao, and they moved on to understand economics in a, in a way that the West related to it. It's not necessarily, it did not necessarily mean that, uh, that they, under, they agreed with everything the West was prescribing, uh, in the 1953, Indian Economic Association came out quite strongly against Keynesian economics. In 1954, V.K. Rao wrote a seminal paper on why Keynesian economics will not work in the developing world. But essentially, it was put into a particular context. And that context grew, and uh, over time, you had a great deal of success with that tradition. It was a tradition built into the Delhi School of Economics and uh, as Professor T.N. Srinivasan uh, will tell, uh, tell us, uh, which is also a tradition built in the in, in, uh, Indian Statistical Institute. And it's a tradition not to be trifled with when we look for my generation, because it's a generation that produced a Nobel Prize in Amartya Sen. It's a generation that produced an economist who could lead a reform process like Dr. Manmohan Singh, who also, of course, went on to become uh, Prime Minister. It's a generation that produced people who led uh, the economics departments of, of many universities uh, across the world. And this was a tradition that, uh, including the Ivy League universities, which uh, uh, Professor T.N. Srinivasan was the chairman of Yale. And in this broad tradition, you had a, a growing sense of using a method that evolved, a method that we stick quite uh, loyally to, a method based on large data. It is in the con in meanwhile, you also had a growth of uh, Indian sociology moving in quite a different direction. Professor Srinivas led the consolidation of social anthropology and, and in the process established, or I should say consolidated, the, uh, the method of ethnography and participant observation. Uh, he came up with multiple uh, uh, concepts that would be useful for academia, including that of Sanskritization. What is perhaps less known is concepts that we popularly use today or their origin to Professor Srinivas, notably the concept of a vote bank. And you have a growing tradition in which uh, social anthropology grew, but has hap as always happens or sometimes happens in India, the commitment to the methods of both sociologists and economists has sometimes gone beyond a rational debate. It has become an emotional feud, and with each succeeding generation, we have now reached a point where the method, social anthropologists talk of a method, emphasis on, on ethnography is just not shared by economists, and the economists' emphasis on large data is scoffed at by social anthropologists. We could even say today that it is not unusual for social anthropologists to dismiss economic models as so much mumbo jumbo, and for economists to treat ethnography as a figment of a fertile Im imagination. It is in that context that when we invited Professor T.N. Srinivasan to deliver this lecture and he agreed, there was a, a question as to what he would speak about. And when he decided to speak about Professor Srinivasan's own work, there's a question about how he would bridge this divide. It's a huge gap. 
uh, which uh, between economists and and uh, social anthropologists, but something that one of the doyens of Indian economics is best suited to do. So I would like you to welcome uh, to join me in welcoming Professor T. N. Srinivasan. May I now request Professor Srinivasan to give us the 15th memorial, uh, M. N. Srinivasan Memorial Lecture. It's a great pleasure to be at this institute and to be asked, and an honor to be asked to deliver the 15th M. N. Srinivas Memorial Lecture. It is an honor at many levels. First of all, compared to the achievements of Srinivas in establishing a field and being a pioneer, to speak about him without being a member of his discipline, namely sociology and social anthropology, is a major challenge. And nonetheless, I accepted the challenge because Srinivas himself, in his, uh, uh, Professor Narsimha, uh, in his introduction to the first memorial lecture for uh, Ch Chamu Srinivas, pointed out that Srinivas was uh, a strong proponent of interdisciplinary research, and he wanted each discipline to be subjected to the potential criticism that could arise from other disciplines studying this similar problem as they were. And this belief of Chamu Srinivas encouraged me to think that he would indulge my trying to use his framework to see what, where India is, so to speak, Rural India is, and India as a whole is in today. So that's the challenge that I have to oh, try to overcome. If I can, we will see. Yes. Now, I want to start with the uh, a picture of rural India uh, in, based on census 2011 data. And then go on to Srinivas's structural functional model as an analytical framework for understanding, characterizing, and analyzing rural India. The main elements of his uh, uh, framework the idea or concept of a dominant caste in a village and the processes, dynamic processes of Sanskritization and Westernization. That's one framework that is the Srinivas framework for understanding rural India. But an alternative to Srinivas's framework of rural India by itself is what is what could be called big picture framework of integrated and interrelated rural and urban India. This is a two-way relationship between rural India and urban India as the centerpiece of an, the alternative narrative. So this leads and one of the basic important elements of that alternative narrative and which Srinivas also emphasized in his very, the uh, book, The Remembered Village, uh, is urbanization. Again, once again Srinivas, in his very first chapter of The Remembered Village, points out that there is one process that was going on, namely urbanization, in which upper caste, particularly Brahmins, were the leaders. And this is a process in, when, at, the, at the time he wrote Remembered Village, he thought 
was inadequately analyzed and that needed analysis, this uh, process. And that uh, e le leads me to a digression on Tamil Brahmins. The digression arising from the fact someone else, namely the two anthropologists, Fuller and Haripriya, have taken on the Srinivas' suggestion of analyzing the urbanization of Brahmins. Now, I should also, uh, I, would, I would also include actions needed for India in the economic sphere in mainly uh, to uh, meet some of the aspirations India set, has set for itself. And in that context, I would like to uh, emphasize again an idea that Chamu uh, was very much in favor of, namely interdisciplinary research. I will list a bunch of topics which in my view requires an interdisciplinary view, interdisciplinary look at this time in our country. First, a broad picture of rural India from census of 2011, rural population of 833 million is 69% of the total population. Interestingly enough, rural population declined from 72% in 2001, indicating the force of urbanization. Gap between rural and urban literacy rates are closing for both males and females. Labor force participation rates, I should have said, put a U in front of this, that is usual, usual status, principal status and the secondary status. That's the basis on which these participation rates are computed. Usual status meaning the status, principal status meaning the status in which the individual spends the majority of the time in a year. And the secondary status is the next activity in which that person might be engaged in. So in the, on that basis, male, the, the rural participation rate is 55% while the female participation rate is 25%. And the urban area, the male participation rate is 56%, and the rural participation rate is 16%. Uh, the ratio of workers to population is 46% in rural areas and 36% in urban areas. The shares of private consumption and investment in rural areas is likely to be substantial, but unlikely to be as high as the share of the population, namely 69%. The two-way interaction, as I said earlier, between rural and urban areas has to be needs, needs to be studied, and that too with an analytical framework that is convincing and uh, rigorous. Let me next. Srinivas's framework and its uh, elements. One of the major element in Srinivas's analysis is the so-called dominant caste. Dominant caste is defined in terms of several attributes one of the attributes is the ownership of land. And remember, we are talking about rural India and we are talking about village. And it's very natural. Agriculture is the more significant activity in the village and the particular asset that is needed to proceed with agriculture is land. And so it's very natural the 
dominant caste is one which has a large share of this particular asset, namely land. And again, we are talking about rural India and village, and again, caste comes in. And so, this dominant caste will have a significant share of the land in the village, and it will also have a fairly high status in the caste ranking. So you have a caste, uh, the higher rank, and ownership higher rank going together in the, in the dominant caste category. And there are a couple of other uh, attributes which I won't go into in detail, but so it's a, it's not a vague concept, it's a concept which is well uh, articulated with attributes and so on. And the second thing is to look at the intra-caste re relationships after defining the dominant caste, how does the dominant caste r relate with the intra, uh, with other castes of the Hindu religion and also non-Hindu groups in the village, such as Muslims, for example. The, the structural functional approach to inter-caste relations think, views these relations in terms of, first of all, functionality. So if you are a uh, laborer, you are looking for an opportunities for employment, and if the dominant uh, caste uh, actor is the one who is going to provide labor for you, the relationship between the uh, dominant caste and the laborer becomes the function of the need for labor in agricultural activities at various points in time. And you can easily see how the gender comes in. Think of rice cultivation, which, which was the, uh, in, in his Rampura village was a major activity, transplanting, transplanting of uh, saplings into uh, which is very extremely important that is a major the comparative advantage in that activity is for females and so it's no surprise the relationship between the dominant caste landholder cultivating rice with the females of the lower caste would involve significant uh, aspect of this transplanting and weeding and other kinds of activities that are associated with agriculture. That is the, the, the uh, functional approach to the relation, the function uh, that I described. And there is also the structural approach, that is to say that the, uh, there is a structure, so to speak, in the uh, structure and rhythm and time facing in the activities that uh, take place in a village associated with agriculture. And that also calls for different types of labor at different points in time over the crop cycle. And that, again, is an aspect of functional functional uh, uh, relationship. And the structure, as I said, is the structure of the, of the uh, agriculture as a major activity in the village. So this framework, when, when the, in Srinivas's hand, socially explains social structure in distinguishable units. These units are, has its own cults or jatis. So occupation and jati combination comes in in this context. And there is a hierarchy across caste. So this caste hierarchy and the structure of jatis comes through clearly in his approach. 
And once this framework is set up, it is not only applied in the, at the village level to the main activity of agriculture, but also other economic relationships, social relationships, and political relationships between jatis. So the, that's the framework, analytical framework, of, uh, as I understand it, of uh, Chamu Srinivas. And then he described two processes, dynamic processes taking place over time. One is Sanskritization, which is, a, which is uh, Srinivas's term of lower caste adopting the practices uh, of rituals and other practices of upper caste in an attempt to upgrade their ranking in the caste hierarchy. So that's the Sanskritization. Now, that process, it is important to recognize. Srinivas said this is not a new thing. This has been happening for a very long time. And so this is a dynamic that plays over long periods of time. It's not a short-term dynamic. And the, the next the process that he describes is westernization. This is different from the Sanskritization process of upward mobility of lower caste, attempted upward mobility of lower caste to upper caste. This is about upper caste themselves adopting <coughs> practices, lifestyles of the Western the culture and they thereby leading other castes in the same process of westernization. Okay? So this is the Srinivas's framework of Sanskritization and westernization. So now I come to the next. Now I come to the, my thinking about this on a uh, as an economist. So, economists would distinguish variables into two categories, uh, exogenous variables for, for the, in, the, in this case for the village determined from outside the system and given to, outside the village and given to the village. The village has no role in the determination of those variables. It takes them as given to, to itself. And then there are endogenous variables. These are responses of the village, village or villages to the given exogenous forces. For example, the, if a, in the Srinivas a disciple uh, her name escapes me. Uh, yes, uh, his student, um, uh, Scarlett Epstein. Am I, am I pronouncing the name right? Yes. Yes. She is the in in this in this term in the economist terminology. Her exogenous given variable was the irrigation that uh, the Krishna Raja Sagar construction brought in. That's the, uh, that's the shock, external shock to the village. Uh, then the response or endogenous villages, how does the village react to the irrigation? This, uh, you have to have irrigation if you have to react to irrigation. And so in uh, Scarlet's the framework, she took two villages, one which had access to irrigation, the other which did not. So then she looks at the processes, same things that Srinivas looked at in his study, uh, to see how the two villages responded to the technology shocks. So in, the, in that sense, what the economist model does, it is tries to, tries to explain so to speak, each 
response in terms of other, resp other responses as well as the exogenous given variable. That's the model. And uh, there are econometric estimation and other issues which I won't need to, I don't need to go into and I won't go into. But this is an explanation, I try to explain the responses of the village in terms of responses with respect to other things as well as exogenous variables. Now the question arises, are, is, are these relationships of the model purely in the analyst's imagination or, or are they, do they have any, are they derived from any normative criteria? Now in Srinivas's framework, as I understand it, the one broad objective of the village as a whole is to, the, to sustain it. The sustaining the village as a, was an objective everybody in the village shared. This is a common objective. And I would, uh, so that's the framework. And Srinivas's view, the, he didn't take the model is a once and for all given thing. He, said he, will, he will treat it as a heuristic, take the model and run it and it will see as far as it goes. And if it, you should don't push the model beyond its capacity. And at that stage you have to, when you have pushed it to this capacity, you have to think through what uh, alternatives that you have to bring in to the model. Now this is very much like a, a, in scientific methodology. You have a hypothesis, you maintain the hypothesis, try to test the hypothesis against the evidence. The evidence, you test the hypothesis against a potential alternative with data, and as long as the alternative, uh, the data uh, do not support the alternative relative to the maintained hypothesis, you maintain the hypothesis. So only when enough evidence emerges that uh, convincingly rejects the maintained hypothesis in favor of the alternative, the maintained hypothesis is the theory. No theory is eternal and all theories are, are uh, for, for a time only. And you don't accept the theory, you only in this methodology, you only see whether they are, uh, the theory can withstand challenges from, from other alternatives. That's the fr scientific framework that, which I see in the, uh, in the Srinivas model. Now, in the hierarchy of jatis, Sanskritization is a process of upward social mobility of a jati in caste ranking. As I said earlier, it has been, uh, Srinivas points out, it has been operating for a long time and it also involves myth creation. You create a myth which says this particular uh, caste has a divine origin. So if it is divine origin, it has been there from time immemorial for the caste. And then you also change the name of the caste to, uh, uh, to, uh, to that of the twice born uh, Varna of the traditional uh, Vedas, the four Chatur Varnya or four for Varna classification. So this is the this is the myth creation of, of the caste in its upward mobility. As long as the myth is, as you do it until your myth is accepted by other 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 castes as well. So that then you reach the your goal of pushing your caste above the in the in the ladder. Now, I would argue 
there is an analog of this at the pilgrim centers as well. Now, each pilgrim center is trying to attract visitors to that, to that center. Now, you create a myth, Rama or, uh, the, or one of the Puranic characters from uh, Ramayana or Mahabharata or Bhagavatam has visited this temple. And so that's the myth, the, just the association of the temple with that particular visit. Take Rameshwaram, for example. Rama, uh, in the legend, Rama did the puja of Shiva at Rameshwaram. So that's the myth associated with the Rameshwaram. So you can take any pilgrim center in India, which uh, yeah, at least in South India, you have a Salapurana to go with it. Not only with the Salapurana to go with it, but also in the Bhakti movement in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in South India, originated in South India, you have the Arvars and, and, uh, and the Saivite analogs of the, of the Arvars, Nayanmars, the, uh, the composing verses in favor of the deity in that particular village. That's also part of the Stala Purana. The latter is reality. The former is legend. Rama uh, coming and doing the puja is legend. But the Nayanmars and Arvars singing about Rama and the, in the temple is, is reality. So in Srinivas calls, is, again, this is a, uh, digressing somewhat. Srinivas was also uh, said that he believes in uh, the importance of real history, but this should be distinguished from conjectural history. I interpreted what Srinivas calls conjectural history as legend. Legend treated as history, as sometimes this Science Congress this year seems to have done, that that, that is conjectural history. Srinivas was firmly against that, but real history is, uh, is uh, uh, important. Now, if you think of it this way, now, compared to the intra-village cooperation among castes in the broader objective of maintaining the village and also sub sustaining the major activity of cultivation, that's a cooperative relationship. This Purana creation, uh, whether it is Sala Purana or Kas Purana, this is a competitive relation. We are competing, each jatis are competing with each other, uh, or these pilgrim centers are competing with each other. So competitive relationship with a co-op, as contrasted with a cooperative relationship, is what the Srinivas's framework suggests in looking at, at, the, at the rural areas. Next. Now, Srinivas said, wanted to look at the caste, caste in, in his overview, which he, which he did just a year or two before his uh, death. That in this overview, now, he draws attention to, of course, westernization and points out the upper caste are the leaders in the process of westernization. Uh, and uh, at the same time, lower caste was Sanskritization. However, he wa wants, this does not mean higher caste were abandoning their caste-related uh, aspects and the lower caste were not westernizing. They were doing that too, but the leaders were upper caste in this process. Uh, improvement of communication, popularity of pilgrimages, this is running the clock forward to now, 
the and the popularity of holy men uh, spread of spread of education as well as globalization contributed to the popularity of sanskritization that's his uh, his uh, his prediction now so this raises the question now where does the when he talks about urbanization and the one part of the urbanization is the agricultural classes which move to urban areas become lower, lower middle class or middle class in the class terminology so whether he and he look at shrinivas again looks at the assertions of dalits Uh, of equality and he cites uh, nira bara study on dalits uh, deliberately practicing rites and rituals of upper caste knowing full well the upper caste can do damn all about it and the uh, uh, shrinivas cites it and uh, he goes on uh, he concludes as india becomes more urban and heterogeneity becomes the norm caste identities again will will uh, become more important and so this this process is cryptic in his, this this is a very cryptic description that uh, he brings in but there are others who have who have lo- who are looking at the same problem and i again I cite a few, just three. One is uh, the Dasgupta, the, the, the Deepankar Dasgupta. The other is uh, Satish Deshpande, I think. And the third is uh, Martin. Now, Martin looks at the same uh, the story of Bara Dalits, the the uh, the uh, uh, trying to. Uh, the, the assert their position in Punjab, and uh, Martin argues, given the uh, the westernized and uh, the uh, Punjab, it has uh, with the relationships abroad glo- globalized Punjab. The uh, the other the business related groups in Punjab have such a dominant position. in many aspects of the village the dalits dalits who are asserting their power are not challenging the their these these groups so in that sense uh, the martin says don't think to don't think that the dalits assertion has uh, uh, reached its full full goal in punjab yet the upper caste through the relationships that are associated with globalization and businesses etc have kept the lower caste and the dalits in check now whether this check will operate in other parts of the country is another matter but this is this is what martin's analysis deshpande's analysis is very interesting again in the shrinivas framework the think of this way i mean i give some data you will see it in a moment uh, the uh, upper caste in today's uh, the social group classification uh, upper caste are in the category other okay the others include upper caste so what does that mean in deshpande's analysis in effect they have lost their caste identity without losing ca- their caste themselves and so this has an interesting interesting uh, 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 the view of of the same process they have not the upper caste in the in, in the day in the the bara in the martin terminology are have managed to maintain their power but in in uh, deshpande they they maintain power 
but they are no longer calling themselves upper caste. They are calling themselves the others, other other group, casteless group. That's the so. This is interesting. Now, contemporary India. I want to look at a few statistical pictures by social groups. Remember the data on by social groups is recent. This is the. the 70th round of the national sample survey which had a spe- special thing on uh, status of agricultural households and social groups this had the time series data of this sort doesn't exist uh, for this but here you this is the first one in terms of percentage distribution of households this is sheer numbers you see almost in every the upper class the large categories of large landowners the the two categories that are important are the obc and the other is the other caste obc is a pure caste social grouping the others as i said is the upper class masquerading as casteless so and they are the ones which are holding the uh, the 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 top category of land holdings in the village now the in terms of activities now self employment this is well known this for a long time we know that self employment is the dominant employment category in india in rural areas and also significantly in upper areas as well here we are looking at the self employment in within the self employment category activities that you are self employed in cultivation livestock farming other agricultural activities non agricultural enterprise the last category uh, wage and salaried employment thus that is a group that includes casual labor as well because that's a labor category notice except for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes the the categories that are the obc and others are the categories that are important in cultivation see then 50% nearly 50% of others upper caste and 42% of the obcs are self cultivating farming activity that's their occupation now in, t- in terms of the same uh, uh, the classification distribution of households in number over uh, uh, the activities well, again look cultivation across across states in india the uh, cultivation is the dominant activity uh, in self employment but the the lowest in cultivation is uh, kerala and the highest in cultivation if i remember right is uh, chatisgarh yeah and so on so the, the, there are interstate variations in 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 uh, in the self employed activity now the dominance of obc and upper caste i said uh, in the land ownership dominance of cultivation except for sedulkas interstate variation in ownership now this is time trends in ownership and you will see there is uh, one aspect of it i should point out now there was a if you see the uh, landless households except for the most recent year 2013 the there was no variation in the landless see no significant variation in the proportion of landless in the national sample service and again the land under cultivation uh, land under oh, so ownership also did not change until 19 uh, until after 1992 but only in the recent years the land ownership has come down now that remember we talked about urbanization that 
see these are these data are collected from those who are living in the village these are based on village households responses if land has been transferred to the house builders who are in uh, living in urban areas or uh, urban people who are ho holding land in villages they won't be captured here and they would be in the urban other category so there again so this notion uh, of dominance of obc and the other uh, comes through now uh, the ownership uh, in terms of uh, the uh, this 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 slide may puts the picture in greater detail in terms of size class of ownership and the area owned and except as, as i said large category the ownership large and medium category is in the hands of obc in the hands so is recent shift uh, reduction contemporary in the situation in agricultural households the latest round uh, store story now this is in terms of per capita consumption expenditure classes this is a substitute for income uh, this this slide shows once again the two categories obc and others are the ones uh, uh, that are important in decile 10 which is the richest decile in the category uh, and the at the lower end st and ac are different in all other categories the obc and the other category are are, are emerging or the dominant ones now this slide is by principal source of income the nss for a long time never collected data in on income it was always consumption expenditure in my view rightly and for valid reasons but in this census in this uh, survey they are they are using the word income and they are collecting data supposedly on income i i have my reservation on the income that they are putting together but such as it is the income classes that they have marked monthly per capita consumption expenditure classes this uh, the it gives you uh, total expenditure consumption expenditure and net investment these are the two activities in uh, which you use income on and you have the the total income here and you will see you have to go up to several category decile categories before income exceeds consumption plus investment so the the poverty of running into debt because your income is not adequate to meet your consumption expenditure and what little investment that you do comes through in this in this data and that last slide in this case is on the on the uh, uh, sale of produce by the households you remember the minimum support price and every year the agitation to raise the minimum support price but if you look at the the these villages agricultural households they don't sell to these uh, government agencies which pay the minimum support price on the other hand their sales are to other agencies and they claim that they get better price than the minimum support price in the in the in the rural areas so that's the statistical picture so now uh, as a sum up the although many public policy interventions have taken place since uh, shrinivas's rampura study uh, the changes have been gradual role of dominant caste not eroded uh, emergence of dalits as a political force might disturb the rural scene but it is in the future land distribution is still concentrated a potential force is urbanization of jati groups and the brahmins that shrinivas had mentioned in the in the 
uh, in his first chapter. Now, the other one is the landlord or dominant caste serving in several categories, several capacities as money lender, as employment provider, etc., as a land provider for tenancy and so on. That this interlinking of markets for land, tenancy, labor, etc., that has been studied extensively. This again goes back to Srinivas' uh, analysis. And I won't want, I don't want to go into this literature. I mean, how much time I have? I have already exhausted. Five, ten minutes. Okay. Now, I had, uh, since Srinivas talked about the uh, uh, urbanization of Brahmins, and also he said this is a uh, process that was in Mysore and the other parts of South India. Uh, one, two uh, anthropologists, Fuller and Haripriya, took up Srinivas' challenge. The early studies on Tamil Brahmins uh, was by none other than Andre Betai in the Sri Kantapuram Sripuram village in my district, Tanjavur, and also Kathleen Gau, uh, uh, Gau study. And so since then, there have been no, at least Fuller and Haripriya claim, since then there have been no uh, in-depth study of Tamil Brahmins. And these two uh, uh, anthropologists do. They want to, there are several main conclusions, but the main, one of the main conclusions is Brahmins have been more transformed than any non-Brahman agrarian classes into modern urban middle class groups. Squarely, you move from cultivating class, uh, cultivating uh, caste into a, uh, the middle class, caste class transformation. So Tamil Brahmins now constitute a social class come status group, which is in itself structured by an isomorphism between Tamil Brahminhood and middle middle classness. This is what Fuller and Fuller and uh, Narsimhan claim. But uh, I don't. Uh, I, I'm not entirely persuaded, and I don't have the time to go through in detail uh, that phase. One thing I would uh, mention. Which, whether they would mention or not, uh, uh, is the uh, trading groups in uh, of uh, 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 no, no, before I come to trading groups, uh, the, let me the, the Tamil Brahmins and the, uh, South Indians when they grow went wherever within India or abroad did three things. Establish a school for st to teach uh, South Indian languages. Two, a music sabha to serve the purpose of culture and a temple. The temple served several, the temple with uh, vigrahas of all uh, the, uh, the Hindu gods installed because this is a this is a, to, to cater to all uh, the groups Hindu groups and so the temple served also as a social uh, play meeting place for performing rituals and so on and so forth so these three I don't know whether uh, the Fuller and uh, Haripriya mentioned this so that in my view uh, explains the the logic of the middle classness or the other things are not important, but the maintenance of a culture, South Indian culture, has been the driving force, in my view, of the uh, of the of the South Indian uh, diaspora, whether it is in India or or abroad. Now, the trading group. This is. Uh, this is my personal episode of frustration. The, as you know, sir, sir, the Cholas, during the Chola period, many t t trading groups, many uh, Chola groups sent uh, uh, armies 
to Southeast Asia and uh, the traders, uh, South Indian traders also went to, went to Southeast Asia and they had guilds uh, or groups, trading guilds uh, in uh, Shreni in Sanskrit but uh, uh, I don't remember the kind of analog, Tamil analog word f for that. The one person who had studied all the Tamil inscription is the late Naboru Karashima. And I, have, I was in, I had email correspondence with him. Leaving him aside, none of these, uh, he said, I am not familiar with the uh, dispute settlement, etc. issue, so uh, this needs to be looked into. I, the historian colleagues in Tamil, Tamil Nadu, Chennai, discourage me completely. Don't go anywhere near it. There is nothing in it. There is nothing for you to do anything in this area. And so there I am. In my uh, my attempt to try to do a historical research on Tamil Nadu ended there. There. Okay. Now the la last uh, or topics for interdisciplinary research, and I'm going to stop with that. The National Academy of Sciences, uh, Rodham will know, the, has instituted a prize for convergence research for uh, integrating one or more disciplines, uh, listed disciplines, a wide range of disciplines, uh, uh, and, uh, and in the context of uh, uh, health research, not just integration, integration that is brought about for research on health. And the guy who got the first award, Chad Mirkin, was awarded the prize for impressively integrating various disciplines for the imp rapid and automated diagnosis of infectious diseases. Imagine, you, without, you don't have to wait for days or for within hours, you can get the result, your blood test results or diagnosis results. And this is what this guy has done. And this, I, I, again, I don't need to say that this is something which we need very badly. And this is a one area of interdisciplinary research. But this, some, uh, such research has to be based on factual data. Now, think of the opposite of health, namely morbidity. Believe it or not, the National Sample Survey has been collecting morbidity data from the seventh round in 1953-54 on. And it stopped that series of data collection in the 28th round in 73-74. Now, after a hiatus, the uh, National Sample Survey has again, is again collecting morbidity data under its quinquennial surveys on social consumption. Now, if you go look at the reports of these quinquennial surveys, there is no discussion of what was learned by the earlier surveys. Earlier surveys were primarily designed to motivate, uh, to, to develop methodologies. This new survey doesn't even uh, say anything what, what we learned and what we are trying to learn in the new service, no, none of that. So, but if you try to do an, uh, did the analysis of in, the rank thick st Indian states by, the, uh, the, by its, its morbidity, by, uh, deviation of its morbidity rate from the national average in percentage terms. This is simple percentage. It is not morbidity rate, it's a deviation of morbidity. Which state in India shows the highest, the highest morbidity compared to all India average? Can you guess? Kerala. Kerala is the sickest state in, by way of morbidity data. The latest data or the I did the, the, the thing to do, do the, the thing for the earlier years, and still Kerala, uh, no less than the Amartya Sen, has speculated on this in his 2002 paper. His speculation is: if you are in Bihar, uh, you take for granted various diseases; you don't even think of them as diseases, and 
Uh, and uh, and your also your social status is low socioeconomic status, so you don't say you are sick. Whereas if you are in Kerala, there are several days treatments available and uh, fairly inexpensive. So you say even if you had a minor cold, you say I have a I have an ailment that needs addressing. I don't know whether you find this persuasive, but there are couple of research papers try to do test this sen hypothesis uh, in an econometric fashion but that uh, i'm not entirely persuaded for various reasons and i don't want to uh, i hope uh, i want i am trying to get this project going try to do a comparative analysis of the data available on morbidity now next one more field i want to mention is about risk spreading, risk uh, risk uh, uh, spreading, risk sharing, and r risk itself, risk in the activities. There are this is a major issue, and it arises in several contexts: health, construction, energy, architecture, weather, and climate change. Once again, you need a lot of inter interdisciplinary research on this area. One more. The field of neuronomics. I don't know how many of you heard of the field of neuronomics. This developed about 20 years ago or so. The, the looking at neuroscience and the economics together. Okay, and the, how does that go? Your suppose you know. The, you can classify people as risk lovers, uh, risk neutral people, and risk risk lovers, risk neutral, risk uh, risk lovers, risk neutral, and and you put the, the one of them uh, I, and watch look at their brain while they are making a decision about one of the investment opportunity. Does, does different parts of the brain get activated uh, if, you, if you look at the brain of a risk averse person or uh, as compared to the uh, as a risk neutral person? This is one issue, but there are many issues. The field of neuro, neuronomics started on that interdisciplinary field. And there, is, there are surveys of what has been achieved by that field in the uh, in the literature, starting from one of the earliest surveys by George Lowenstein. Now, my concluding remark. Last week, none other than Chris Gopalakrishnan, the co-founder of Infosys with Narayan, Narayan Murthy, was in Chennai, doing nothing else, promoting the use of internet in brain research. Okay, I don't know whether he mentioned neuronomics at all, but in my view, what Chris was talking about is very much in the field of neuronomics, and that is an area which India could usefully do additional research on. Thank you very much. So my question pertains to something which is slightly different from the topic of your uh, yes. talk. Yes. This is uh, the role of Britain Woods institutions in developing countries. Ooh, role of which institutions? Britain, Britain Woods institutions like IMF and World Bank. Yes. There was a book uh, earlier on which talked about World Bank and the poverty of nations. Yes. Uh, so I just wanted your behavioral, comments. Behavioral economics. Uh, sir. That's what you're so, talking about. That's actually how their policies resulted in poverty of uh, developing nations rather than improving as their policies purportedly yes. uh, stated. Yes. So I just wanted your comments on that, sir. Whether, so whether World Bank has made countries <laughs> poorer? Is that the question? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So there was a lot of uh, debate on whether these Britain Woods institutions were actually are these policies uh, help the developing countries or uh, they reverse them? No, I, I, I would put it this way. There are aspects of policies, whether it is World Bank or Government of India or any other government, 
which have a, a, a at least a side effect that would go uh, against the poor, while its main effect may be in the direction of in uh, reducing poverty. So whether, but that's not the relevant question, it seems to me. Any, any medicine, if you take also as beneficial and uh, possibly non-beneficial side effects. That's not the issue which you ask, you say, is it, is there an agenda? This is the uh, argument that is made. World Bank has an agenda to impoverish the developing nations. That uh, is difficult to uh, uh, the accept as a p uh, fact, because after all, the members of the World Bank, the or may, or many poor, 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 most poor countries are members of the World Bank. And uh, in many major activities, the World Bank has to have the board's approval. And, uh, and the representatives, executive directors, represent several countries there. So it, if, it is, if that happens, the agenda is shifted towards poor, the poverty uh, increase rather than poverty alleviation. It's not the fault of World Bank as an institution, but all these guys sitting there as executive directors, letting World Bank go get away with that. With that. That's what I would, I would argue. Yes? So, I have a question. Okay. So in, in the Srinivas framework, you mentioned that as societies progress yeah. and evolve, caste will once again become uh, yeah. the reason for identity yes. and uh, caste will emerge as the identity. I wanted to know a little more because uh, it's a very contrarian belief that we have as yes. laymen yes. that as societies evolve, it's caste which is, dissolves itself. So yes. why did he think so and the, what the, is the thought the, about it? Uh, that's a very good question. I had the same problem. Now, it is a very cryptic, cryptic remark. Uh, in in his autobiographical essay about uh, uh, in the, that published in uh, the J journal of anthropology uh, i don't remember the journal name rio 1997 now one uh, process i could think of which is again that needs to be uh, you know, not to be gone into in some depth is the function, the, the use of caste, as compared to uh, the earlier, the uh, Rampura period, and the use of the same caste in today's uh, the India, could be very different. The same landlord having a functional relationship with his uh, caste in the in the uh, with the other caste in the village, now is not looking for a functional relationship in the village itself, but other uh, all, all over the country and uh, abroad. If you are a b b today's businessman, you don't care whether the em your employee comes from country X or country Y, uh, etc. But you might use your caste connections to the select, uh, this is the usual, you remember uh, in the going again, going back to earlier years, Heather Joshi did a study of the Bombay labor market and the role of jobbers in the Bombay labor market. Earlier on the village, from the village, somebody has gone to Mumbai and working in the textile mill. The textile mill owner trusts that, that guy and he asked, from your village, bring, bring workers for me. That kind of relationship was the way the upper caste or the ownerships were using. Now, contemporary usage might be very different, but I haven't, uh, the, the, uh, I didn't see anything more on it by Srinivas, so I'm speculating. But that's, that's a very good, very good question. Yeah. So my question is uh, about social security, the system which is there in many European countries. 
I can't remember. Social security. Social security, yes. Yes. Uh, although many governments I hear uh, take this responsibility as a burden, but it has many advantages. Yes. Is it possible to adopt that in India? No, we are trying to do the social security uh, in India in different ways. Uh, the program, for example, for health also. See, see now they attempted at least in the on paper, but not only to produce. So, think of pensions. Tamil Nadu started it long ago to old age pension of a small amount to uh, given just pure age consideration, nothing else. The same thing. Pensions are being given right now. So that is a form of social security. The other is trying to provide, again, universal health care. Now, one of the major problems uh, uh, the, of the insecurity, uh, life insecur insecurity that arises, is from health considerations. If, uh, for example, if the prime uh, wage, uh, prime income earner, of a household passes away and there is no other uh, income earner in that household, that household is going to be in great trouble. Okay? So insurance, providing life insurance for households is one way of mitigating some of the kind of shocks that might come from, from that sort of a li lifetime event. So that is, that's all being at least proposed in the, uh, in the current uh, framework. And so I wouldn't say it's not being tried. It is, it is being, being tried in different dimensions, not in, uh, in the, so the cash dimension is very much there, social security dimension. Sir, basically my question was uh, related to this economically deprived class. Like uh, farmers, for example, there are many farmer suicide cases, and yes. uh, and the cases go on only you know after the death there is some money given. But as such, is there any policy no, change possible you, to address you, this? You see, you see, uh, let me put it this way: if you examine, uh, the, it is said the contemporary newspaper accounts of farmer suicides in Maharashtra or elsewhere is that the farmer couldn't service his dead and he committed suicide. Okay? That's the story, usual story. Now, if you look at the farmer's debt, that which he couldn't service, it was accumulated over a long period of time. And that during the long period of time, the cause of his borrowing and may not have anything to do with the agriculture or cultivation of BT cotton or whatever. It, he might have married uh, his daughter of, and the the dowry part of South India. He might have spent a, a huge sum on marriage, and and he would have borrowed by pledging his land uh, for the marriage, funeral ceremonies. There are many purposes for which loans are taken. And who are the? Think of it this way: the 1969 banks were nationalized. Rural banks, rural branches were to be opened, and all that. The idea was to provide investment opportunity, safe investment opportunities to rural households. What the banks did, basically, is to siphon off the rural savings and used it in in uh, urban areas. Now, if you are in rural areas, if the banks are not going to lend you. Now, who is the source for your uh, loan, local money lender. And so local money lender, if you look at the one of my slides, is still a major source of credit to rural households. And he has many advantages. He is, his door is open any time of the day. He can go knock at the door at the night and uh, get his money. And uh, he can be understanding of your circumstances also much better than the bank manager who might be from some other part of the country who is running the local bank branch of a nationalized bank. Uh, so for all these reasons, this notion that uh, farmer suicides are all due to uh, debt 
uh, accumulated from uh, agriculture is, is a misnomer in my view. But this is, I don't want to say that you should accept my view necessarily, but this is, look at the data, data are available, and look at it this way. Yes. I, I would request you to comment on the role of institution of the marriage and uh, economic institutes, the, the institution role, of the economy. Role of what? Role of uh, in, uh, marriage, marriage system Already? and the economic system contributing to the continuation of this caste uh, setup. The, mm. the implications of the role marriage, of marriage as, a, as a contributor to the continuation of caste. Role of marriage itself? As a contributor to the continuation of caste. Oh, as a contribution. Ah, no. Uh, how shall I put it? Now, where one answer would be to say that more intercaste marriages are taking place now than before. This is a, this can be an assertion. This can be asserted, but factually showing it is difficult because there is more attention to intercaste marriages now, and so they are uh, reported compared to what in the earlier years where there was no there was no this was not an important issue and it was not reported. So analysis of this data is another matter, but that's one answer that this is uh, this is promoting. Uh, the uh, spread of the marital relationship across uh, across caste, but I don't. I'm not entirely certain. Uh, my this is a guess. My guess is majority of marriages still continue to be in the old old-fashioned uh, traditional traditional way. That's why Srinivas may be right. The caste may be coming back. Uh, in importance. Uh, now you are looking at for bridegrooms or br brides from for several considerations with, in addition to caste, other aspects as well. And so this is a search, broader search, but nonetheless uh, caste might still be playing a role in that relationship. Because of elections and party politics. Ah, elections is an, corruption I didn't mention, that is another, another story, yeah. Yeah. In what way does this Yeah. 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 But he also made the same prediction mm. that mm -hmm. yeah he is predicting it, here it will it will come back uh, yeah uh, chief no, this is under the, the section wither caste in the in this autobiography that I yes, mentioned yes. yeah anyway and yeah. and the and the and the reason that he said that it may come back mm. is that it's now getting converted to assist to yes. a, an activity yes. which wants a greater share in power yes and in wealth yes and caste identity, yes. we now have the objectives which are different from what they were earlier, we, earlier. but the identity will not die. Uh, yes. And as he said, yes. uh, elections are proving yeah, it all yeah, the time, yeah, yes. including the recent elections yes. in Bihar. Right? Yes. <laughs> well, don't forget Tamil Nadu. <laughs> <laughs> question at the well, back. Interestingly uh, enough, in my p p p view, that the, one of the most caste, like the sickest state, the most caste-ridden state is Kerala in uh, many ways. Excuse me, sir. Uh, caste being uh, hereditary, uh, I was just wondering how Sanskritization has helped people from the lower caste to have that upward mobility in the ladder of caste. You subsidization? No, caste, caste being hereditary, I was just wondering how Sanskritization or imitating the practices of the higher caste mm. has helped the lower caste people to have an upward mobility in the caste ladder, no, but no. otherwise, no. I think an alternative strategy could have been for those in the lower caste at least who believed that caste is a man-made thing or who are the non-believers, they would have totally rejected the caste system and thereby probably would have established 
uh, this you know or destroyed this hierarchy and should have you know Think sort of destroyed the dominance of the upper caste the village you have to earn your living you have to uh, so the day day to day relationships with every other villager and every other villager believes in the caste system so unilateral rejection by individuals will not have any any influence the same this is where this larger ja, cross ja, jati groups and across the country which shrinivas talks about becomes important now you the, the it, is, it is no longer acting uh, on an individual basis but it is in a more powerful group basis now again within village caste group cannot do this this has to be uh, across across the country large caste groups that's what shrinivas is suggesting yeah we find that people get rid of their uh, surnames in bihar you find no surnames gone almost in also uh, himachal i have seen in south india also they are uh, more or less uh, like that mm -hmm. so uh, has it uh, made an impact i mean yes. in, uh, yes. in reducing that caste uh, stigma okay, yeah any research done in that yes i you know i as i said this is a, it seems to me to be a, a hypothesis of shrinivas that needs much more intense scrutiny than it has received so far I, that's what i can say yeah. you are the chairman <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they are just trying to draw your attention to me. Uh, we have been talking about resilience of the caste, yeah. yes. despite globalization, urbanization, yeah. capitalism, yeah. etc. Yes. Now, has have studies been done about resilience of caste to even uh, new faiths and religions? The reason I am asking is, mm. I read a, a letter to the editor in a Pakistani newspaper, yeah. where the writer complained to the editor that he went to an interview. Mm. and the interviewer job interview and the job uh, the interviewer asked him mm. what community do you belong to mm. yes. and that person said i am a muslim mm. he said come on that's all okay yes. are you a gurjar or a rajput or a <laughs> yes. you know khatri or what yes. so i mean so uh, it just brought out the resilience of caste even to uh, the conversion to islam and and, and so on yes uh, have any studies no. been done no, you see you uh, you must at least my understanding is this converted caste what you call converted caste or occupational classification uh, and the same occupation could be a muslim or or a uh, or a hindu okay uh, the, a, so uh, the fact you have a lohar the metal worker a muslim lohar and uh, hindu lohar both are lohar caste ka caste name lohar and some of them in m m pakistan still retain the uh, lohar uh, name the same say the so i, I think we should uh, this is sh we shouldn't uh, confound the occupational classification pure occupational classification which had become uh, caste in the called a caste in the past but had both muslim and hindu uh, muslim hindu or whatever occupy the religion that they profess to that is different from the kind of uh, caste that uh, uh, the uh, coming into importance that uh, chamu was talking about as far as i can tell yeah but as long as the Party politics organized yes. the way it is. Yes. And elections are conducted. Yes. We can be sure the caste consolidation will continue to take place. Yes. Well, the, 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 I will ask you a counter question. Now, did the caste come first or the political party come first? Who mobilized whom? Uh, both the reinforcing the other. Both. Re, that's another matter. 
which is exogenous and which is endogenous. Who, who, what was this? What was the driving force? Was the driving force the caste uh, or the or the political party? Unless a new type of politics, political leaders come up, who do yeah. not believe in dividing the society on caste basis, this will continue yeah. to be there. I do hope there will be a change. Yes, I hope so too. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps on that note, we can uh, yes. allow, we can end with a uh, just saying a very warm thank you to Professor T. N. Srinivasan for his excursion into for an economist excursion into the domain of sociology, uh, a fascinating a fascinating one, if I might add. I'd also like to thank the participants for their active participation in the discussion, and finally, I'd like to thank everyone else who has come for this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you once again for asking me. Yeah. May I now request, uh, uh, request the director to please uh, present a memento and a certificate to Professor Srinivasan.